I'm happy to introduce this morning Jeff LaMarche, the new manager of the Corvette Assembly Plant. Uh, looking at Jeff, it's hard to believe, but he's been with GM since 1981. And he comes to us from the Brownstown plant as manager there. And most importantly, uh, Jeff has had two Corvettes, a 2012 Grand Sport, and he currently is driving a Cyber Grace 221 Coupe. So, Jeff, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Joe. Sorry about the little technical difficulties. Modern technology is what it is. We're trying to get some slides. I'm, I'm going to talk this morning a little bit, give you a sense of my background and my history. I said I started in 1981, so I'll talk a bit about that. And then uh, I do have a little bit of some slide presentations that we'll do just to kind of give you an update of what's been going on in the plant since the, since the start of C7, right? So that would probably be very interesting to hear about here. And I first want to introduce my partner. I'll introduce my wife, Shannon, in the back. <laughs> 28 years this year. We've been married, right? And uh, yeah, you started. Two months ago, 
I thought it was really cool because I was building Camaros and Firebirds. Right, so for most of my career, I thought that was really, really neat to spend those years building Camaros and Firebirds. But it was a great plant. We enjoyed that. Um, time came, you know, that uh, Van Nuys also kind of got hit by the contraction bug. And my wife and I left California and went to Indiana. Went to Marion, Indiana. We were living in India at the time. I went to a stamping plant. I was a quality manager at a stamping plant in Indiana. We had our twins, boy-girl twins. She did all the hard work. So our kids were born there and um, had a great time. Indy's a great town. Loved Indiana. And then we made our first big jump. We went to Mexico for three years. And I was a body shop manager there, um, built full-size trucks in Salau, Mexico. And Salau was a brand new plant. It had opened up in 94, we got there in 96. Um, so we were kind of like the second wave of Americans that were helping the plant get up and run and, and start to grow. I had a great time. Our kids were, were young. They picked up Spanish like nothing. It was a really good experience for all of us you know, to, be, to be out of the country for a bit and see a different side of life. We came back uh, when our kids went to first grade. This was our agreement. The kids were going into first grade, and so it was time to come back to the U.S. Uh, we went to Linden, New Jersey. Yeah, East Coast, right? So we went to West Coast, East Coast. It was really funny. So Shannon asked me, she said, where are all the places we could go? And we put a map up on the wall, and they're here, they're here, they're here. I'd like to go here, but not here. We're going there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's funny because people, people that would come into Linden, when they land in Newark, they'd be like, wow, well, I don't know. This, is, this doesn't look like a place to be. But you drive a half hour outside of Newark, and New Jersey's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It's a fantastic state. We had a great time. Going to New York City all the time. We're 45 minutes from New York City. You know, we go up to Boston. We go to Baltimore. She has a sister in Baltimore. It's still there. So we had, we had a great time. I was a general assembly manager there. And then after a couple years, I transferred over into material because I wanted to just learn that side of the business. You know, we had an opening. And the plant manager said, you know, we're having a hard time getting everybody to transfer in. I said, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I went to learn material. And, and kind of the trivia point out of that is I was a material director during 9-11. And my 9-11 story is that on that morning, a um, small office building on the front of the plant, Linden, and uh, I, had an, I had a ground floor office that faced north, and I used to see the top third of the towers, the Trade Center towers, from my desk. And so that day, a um, person came in my office early that morning and said, hey, I just heard on the radio, you know, a plane hit the Trade Center tower. So I was facing away from the window, turned around, spun around my chair, looked out the window, we both did, and at that moment we saw the fireball go up from the second plane into the second tower. And as you can imagine, I mean, the rest of the day was just, just craziness. I mean, a lot of employees had friends and families that worked in Manhattan, and they're calling and they're trying to find, you know, their loved ones. And so we shut down about lunchtime because it just became apparent. We didn't have anybody's focus. You know, we needed to get people out of there and, and, and find out what's going on. And, uh, you know, it was really tough days. And as a material director, I mean, our job was to get everything, obviously get material in and get trucks out. We had quite a challenge because for about two, three weeks, you know, the borders were shut down. We were trying to get a lot of parts from outside. We were going all over the place trying to get material into the plant to keep the plant running. And we did. We were fortunate in that. We also had a really cool ceremony. GM was one of those companies that really stepped up and they donated a lot of trucks to the New York City Fire Department and Police Department. And about two months after, we had a big ceremony where we brought over the leadership of the New York, New York City Fire Department and we donated. And we were building S10 pickups. <coughs> but we donated not only S10s, but we donated full-size trucks. And it was really made you feel really proud. You know, proud of GM and proud of the country to, to help out. Uh, from Linden, went to Kansas City. And by this time, our kids were in the fourth grade. Went there as a body shop manager during the launch of the Malibu. And uh, we loved Kansas City. Kansas City is an absolutely great, very, very friendly town, very family-oriented town. Uh, both our kids, when they graduated high school, went back to Kansas City. My daughter, for a year uh, in art school, and she came back to Detroit. She goes to College for Creative Studies in, in Detroit. She's a film major. 
our son though went to Kansas State in Manhattan, Kansas, and uh, he's still there and he's happy as he <laughs> Started out as an architecture student. As the norm these days, kids don't go into college with one major and come out the other end, right? They go in and they change and change and change. <laughs> As long as mom and dad are writing the checks, right? <laughs> to change, to change, yeah. Does anybody get out in four years anymore either? Didn't we, we used to have to go in four years, right? And get out? Yeah, that's not the case anymore. It's five, so you know, whatever. But no, they're, they're happy, and we're happy for them. They're in the right place in their lives. So this move uh, from there then to Kansas City, uh, ran the body shop, went to headquarters from there, about 2006 now. Uh, and I was the quality director for North America. So at that time, my responsibilities were the assembly and stamping plans, so quality systems and quality departments for all of the North America stamping assembly plans. Great job, got to see a lot of country. That was really my last interaction with Bowling Green before, before I came this time, interaction with the plan. Steve Grilly, the quality manager for a long time, and all the teams here, Tom Hill, you name it, that we interfaced with them. Um, so I did that for a while, and then I had a second chance to go back to Mexico in my first plant manager job in San Luis Potosí. And San Luis Potosí is the youngest assembly plant in the circuit for GM. It opened up in 2009. It is a, uh, it is a great plant. It was a complex. We had an assembly plant, transmission plant, and a stamping plant on the complex. And had a lot of fun there. There's something to be said for surrounding yourselves with a bunch of 18 to 24 year olds every day. It makes you feel pretty young. Uh, so it was a, that was a really cool experience. And so then um, two years ago came back and uh, been, was the plant manager at Brownstown Assembly making lithium ion batteries for the Chevy Bolt. And uh, that was my first Corvette, early opportunity. Had a Grand Sport convertible. My wife and I got absolutely hooked from the moment we, we named her Conchita. <laughs> we love driving Conchita. We put, uh, in six months, I think we put 20,000 miles on that car. <laughs> we'll go everywhere. And it's funny how life sometimes will give you previews of what's to come. So, we, uh, in May, we went to the New Orleans Jazz Festival. And we drove from Michigan you know, two days down to New Orleans. And on the way back, we stopped here. It was my first time in the museum. And uh, we had, had a ball kicked around, and it's like, man, I gotta get Corvette stuff. I gotta get hats. I gotta get shirts. I gotta, I gotta get into this stuff. And uh, little do we know, two years later, you know, I got the call to come down here. People ask me a lot. They say, well, how the heck did you get this job? You know, I mean, for one, you're lucky. But I said, I tell people, I said, you don't lobby for it. You don't ask to come to Bowling Green to to be the manager of Bowling Green. But when GM offers it, it's a real quick. Well, yeah, let's go. You know? <laughs> Our, uh, my coolness factor has gone up exponentially with my kids, <laughs> as you might imagine. Uh, true story, my son just a few weeks ago, so I've been around 33 years in July, first time my son says, he says, Dad, can I have one of your business cards? <laughs> my son, you never asked for any of the other nine plants that I've worked in. He says, I'll bet it's a really cool looking business card. Yeah, son, it's got the C7 flags on it. It's a really cool business card. So, um, exactly, right? So we're here, and uh, Shan and I are absolutely excited. I I'm humble. I'm humble. I mean, this is truly a blessing to be part of the Corvette team. You know, we did asked a lot in my couple months here. What's different about being here than being in any other manufacturing job at GM? And it's around the room, right? It's the interaction with the customers that we get on a daily basis. Tapping into the passion and excitement of this car, the true sports car. Not just American sports car, the true sports car in the world. And it's a lot of fun. On a daily basis, Christine, my assistant, will, will put on my calendar if there's buyer tours in the plant. We have a lot. I mean, there's probably two or three a day these days. So we've got a great partnership with the museum. And that's a lot of fun. So if I'm on the floor and we're walking around, I'll walk up to the museum guide and, and the folks that are in for their tour and you just, just never seen smiles bigger than on the faces of these folks that are there doing the buyer's tour. It's fantastic. So it's a lot of fun. I feel, like I say, very humbled, 
feel the responsibility of making a great car even better, and we will. I guarantee it. That's, I mean, uh, that's my reputation in this company for my 30 plus years has all been about quality and building relationships and helping people untap their creativity. We absolutely are going to do that. 2164 next door, the men and women of our local and GM staff and, and the great program team. We got folks like Taj and Harlan and all the great support we have from the program team. I'm going to have an absolute ball. Absolute ball. So that's my background. Let me, let me talk a little bit about what's going on in the plant.
looks like today. And then as I said again, buy shop's all new. We had to take out the buy shop. You really see the difference. I mean, we've got the latest and greatest of what GM has in their manufacturing facilities, not only in the buy shop, but also in our, in our general assembly. A lot, of, a lot of change. Where we are today in the plants, we're about roughly a million square feet. Uh, we are working five eights. The plant had some times in its history where we were working four ten hour days. We're working five. We're working daily overtime. We're usually about a nine and a half, nine, six, in that range. On an eight hour basis, we would do 137 a day. We're doing right now 165 a day. And we will go to 170 a day June. Uh, appointments at about a thousand. We were down shortly, a little bit less than 500 as we built out C6. So a lot of change in, in Bowling Green assembly plant. It's really quite a bit of a melting pot. You know, with that growth came a lot of transferees from other GM facilities. People that raised their hand to come to Bowling Green, and uh, so we've got folks from all across the Midwest and other plants that have transferred in here. So we have, you know, we have a lot of fair bit of Bowling Green mobiles as well. But uh, it is a plant, like I say, that is very. So there's our current products, as you're all very, very familiar with, the coupe and convertible right now, and then we'll start the Z06 coupe later this year, and then the convertible early next year. And then on our engine side, so the performance built center, we are currently building the LS7 for the Z28. We started in February, and they just started here in the last couple weeks shipping Z28s to the dealerships now. I saw my first one in Detroit. Or last, and the poor guy it was raining. He couldn't even he couldn't keep the tires from spinning and stop lighting. Trying to figure out how to drive it. Um, and then the LT4 on the right. So we are going to be Z06. We will start Z06 production as we fire up and launch not only the car but the new engine at the same time. And we will be a mixture. There will be some LT4s in Z06 that will come from Tonawanda, New York, our main V8 engine plant, as well as our sub. Uh, again, in the body shop, the aluminum frame drove us to a lot of new technology, and some of it new for GM. You know, as an example, it included our spot welding, 354 aluminum spot welds, new process GM patented for the business. Typically, you would see in aluminum bodies, pop rivets, you know, or other adhesive ways of doing it. So we've got a little mix of everything. But we do have some adhesive joining, but we also have a fair bit of spot welding and MIG welding still still panels off still panels off paint paint shop really didn't change a whole lot we've just been adapting the processes to the different plastic materials that we use and this was the the bow of the car last august and you can see the workforce quite a bit bigger than the, the previous picture that we built out and we started shipping last september um, i won't go through this you guys know the you guys know the performance of this car way better than i do uh, and of course then you know, once the car came out, I mean, we started bringing home the awards. And, you know, we just got a couple of them. We hit all of the majors. And the car has won. If there was a significant award to get, I think the Stingray brought it home in 2013. Even Taz here. <laughs> Quebec, and it was interesting because they've been all over the world and they've 
film a lot of the exotics, Bugattis, Ferraris, you name it. And they had well, they, at the end of the week, they also we gave them a car to drive, not we, Tash, marketing. <laughs> um, they had more fun with that car, they said, than you know, exotics, that you, you name the price. They absolutely had all. They couldn't say it out. So really excited and looking forward to seeing the video of that when it comes out later this year. Of course, we get a lot of our famous friends, Rick Hendrick, coming in to pick up one of his several million dollar Corvette. <laughs> I just like to have his throwaway money. Yeah. Yeah. Pocket chain. His pocket chain, yeah, whatever. Whatever he's got laying around. Uh, Plants also received a number of awards. This was last year, one of them for being manufacturer of the year. And uh, the other interesting thing, and I've said this to the workforce, my ninth plant, and I can sincerely say I've never seen a plant more connected to the community than Bowling Green Assembly. If there is something going on involved in, in a community service project or a charity, there are men and women from Bowling Green and 2154 there. Um, very big and united way. You know, we do a lot of work through the GM Foundation, March of Time, Alzheimer's Walk. I mean, we, we, our folks are just fantastic in giving their time, their talent, their treasure, you know, back to this community. Just a few weeks ago, we participated in the Habitat for Humanity. It was a new neighborhood going up in Bowling Green, and GM gave $80,000 to the local Bowling Green Habitat for Humanity bill. And it was super, biggest, you know, donation they've ever had here locally. And uh, so we went out, we had a, I had a group of men and women from the plant, it was snowing that day in Bowling Green. I'm like, what's going on? It's, I thought I moved here because it was not going to be snowing. <laughs> we put the first story of this house up that day. The homeowner is in the lower right, and it was just fantastic being able to see smiles on his face to help this homeowner to have affordable housing for him. So just great. The plan is fantastic about getting involved. Um, sustain the dream. You know, consistent with GM. GM is super big about trying to be environmentally conscious. Um, we are not landfill free in Bowling Green Assembly, and it really kind of comes back to the adhesives and the plastics that we use. There's some things that we use that makes it very difficult to be landfill free, some of like our, our other plants. But we are very mindful of recycling and reducing energy use. You know, for example, in the buy shop demo, recycle hung, hung metal. I'm not trying to put those back. We do a lot of work. There is the wild ha habitat you see as you pull into the plant there. Uh, so we bring a lot of school kids out and work with them, as well as some of our water testing programs that we do with the local schools. So we're, we're just really into that. Of course, you can always go out to our website, CorvetteAssembly.com. You can book your tours there. You can check out things going on at the plant. And that's a little bit about Bowling Green. You can see seven things all there. Questions? Um, so I'll just I'm going to tell you a little bit about, so what do we see on orders? I know there's a lot outside. What we see in the plant really starts at about five weeks out. The sequence for Bowling Green, which is also very unique compared to other GM plants, is actually locked in at about three weeks out. We sequence a lot of material, and uh, some of them as far away as Kansas, actually, which is you know part of that being so far out. But yeah, three weeks out, we're pretty well dialed in. But we'll first get visibility of an order once it's approved and in our system. But beyond that, you know, all the other ones that are out there, we wouldn't know. Hopefully, we wouldn't see. So, got time to take. I'm sorry. Still just in time. Yeah. Very little. Very little. I mean, Bowling Green is a play. I mean, you see the overhead view. It's not real big, and so most of that's really process space. We do have two off-site material partners where we sequence material and store material that we work with that are within five miles of the plant. One's just, just almost across the street. So if you did 170, yes, we did 170 today, 5, 8, 35 a week, right? Yeah. Yeah, we've been doing over 3,000 this year. So really, just volume dependent. You know, orders look good. We'll keep doing it. And you'll know, we'll see what happens as Z06 comes on versus our LT1 business for Coop and Convertible. Let me, let me take him behind you and I'll come back to you. Sure, sure. Uh, it's
three, three a day. We do, and GM has what they call a global customer audit. It's an audit process that goes through fit, finish, function, a drive, about an eight mile drive audit, squeak and rattle check, water full water test, eight minute water test. It's common around the world. And um, for our, vol it's volume driven. The reason why it's three, it's based on our production rate. So at a 165 a day, that equates to what we would do with three plants. Probably wouldn't do any more than five at the, at the largest. But it takes about an hour for a static walk around of inspection of fit and finish and, and work on all of the electrical accessories. And then, like I say, we'll go do a water test, we'll do a squeak and rattle, track drive, and then we'll go out on the road for about eight miles. And we review, so every day we come back and we look at the results. And that's where we talk about as a team, you know, what are the things from a continuous improvement standpoint that, that we're working on? Um, I can tell you that mostly just fit and finish appearance, what things that we're working on. I mean, a mechanical type issue is very rare. You don't really see much in that audit. And they're pulled at random. They're pulled at random. So they're pulled out of vehicles that are ready to ship. <laughs> the friend of, friend of Jeff, check. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. What's your ratio of convertibles? Convertibles right now are about 30%. Okay. And so I think in the plant, you know, we try to spread them out too. We don't typically try to do them back to back. So there, because there's some operations that would really be thrown out of cycle if you tried to do that. So 14 to 15 will be in the later summer, in the August time frame, just for the LT1. Deal sixes is later in the year. I haven't quite said when, but fourth quarter. seen so far. It, it is does have some new technology for us in how we manufacture it and how we electronically program it, drive some new technology. Uh, we were really concerned about it in the beginning because it is new, but it's gone very well. Yeah, it was really a great surprise that it's been seen with so far. So the sequence is locked three weeks out. Advertising that Harlan and I will be back at 1230 
to do a product presentation. I don't know how many of you were there yesterday, but we'll do an abbreviated version of that. And the intent is to have lots of time for question and answers. So uh, Jeff can answer all the process, plant kind of questions, and then the product questions we can take later so everybody can hear the answer. Um, I think the question was, when are we gonna know final uh, performance numbers for the Z06, uh, fuel economy and horsepower? We're still doing our final calibrations. Um, we're getting close to the end. Uh, people have asked me that before. I've said uh, horsepower we'll probably know uh, this summer. Uh, sometime, uh, like Jeff said, we won't be starting production actually until um, right at the very end of the year. Um, so we'll probably know horsepower because we'll, we have to get our final uh, engine calibrations done. So the performance aspects of it have to be done so we can go and test the car on track and do all our last minute work. Uh, the fuel economy tends to be done uh, late because you want to use very, very production representative uh, car. So even though the engine is producing the right amount of horsepower, we're actually still tweaking the aerodynamics of the car, balancing uh, downforce and drag. And so you have to have the car in its absolutely final production form before you know exactly what the drag resistance is, because that goes into the calculation of fuel economy. You actually do a coast down test where you start the car going really fast, and then you measure how fast it slows down and you can use that decel rate to calculate exactly how much rolling res resistance you have out of the, the tires and the rest of the chassis, how much of it is aerodynamic drag. You put all, all that into a very sophisticated dynamometer and then you run on what we call EPA rolls, you run the federal test procedure. So fuel economy probably won't be uh, until fall some, sometime. So that's a long-winded answer of you know summer for a horsepower and fall for fuel economy. So I don't want to take over, this is Jeff's show, <laughs> but uh, we've got any more process questions for Jim. It's going to be built in both places, we just don't have enough capacity here to build them all. Uh, so the current plan is all everybody gets a Z07 option. For sure the engine will be built here in Bowling Green. And if you sign up to build it yourself, uh, you know which we're going to continue uh, build your own engine program. Of course that would be uh, done here. And then the remainder, and it really depends on how many orders we have uh, for Z06s, but we have to have an overflow. We just can't, we don't have the capacity here. And just for everybody's knowledge, there's not going to be any difference between the engines. All the tooling and the way the end is put together, there's exact same parts, exact same torques on every single fastener. So there, you know, physically, uh, engine built here uh, in Bowling Green versus one built in Tonawanda will be identical in the car. Yeah, so we've baked that into our hiring plan because right now, since we're only building Z28, we're just getting into beginning the first shakedown of the LT4 line and equipment. We've got a hiring plan that goes through the rest of this calendar year. But we see those, you know, we see those volumes and we're planning on handling that LS7 volume as well as, like I say, the mix of what we're going to build out of LT4. The, the plan pretty much is laid out to where we have an LS7 assembly line an LT4 assembly line, and then what will be a customer bill line in our engine plan. Yes, Hope to get 
get a, a fast lap, it's very uh, expensive and challenging uh, to get the track all by yourself. Uh, and the one time we tried to do it, it was raining. The track's so big, it was actually dry on part of the track, but part of the track was wet. And uh, unless you have it dry all the way around, you, you have no hope of uh, doing a fast time. So um, it doesn't say, I, I have to go look for it. I'm not sure it's something that we put together in anticipation of a fast lap announcement and then couldn't do it. So I, I'd have to look at the video and see if we had anything to do with it. Or, you know, we've got cars in Europe. Uh, we've been shipping to Europe for a little while. Uh, other people may have uh, taken it and taken it on the track and done some work with it. So I'll have to check it out. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. So when you were going from the car, it was just a little bit of a new shipment. So it was a new week shutdown. Well, the only scheduled shutdown right now for us this year will be Christmas. So the plan does not have a traditional summer shutdown this year. You all keep needing 170 a day. Uh, so, uh, we're working in. We went and hired more folks to handle the vacation that we have over our floors. So we, we've been doing that in the last three, four weeks, bringing people in and getting them trained so that we can start letting our folks. Because, yeah, we don't have what we traditionally rely on a two week shutdown to, for a lot of our folks to take their vacation time in one block. So we need to do it on the fly. So we prep. I have a request and a suggestion. When you got a world class automobile with the gentleman right here in front of us in the church, he would have enhanced our image dramatically. Destroying your plan for you. What was the question? It was a question about should the our employees wear uniforms. And I'm sure that's probably similar to what you've seen in Porsche and some of the other uh, yeah, yeah. For our, we, you know, to be quite candid, I mean, we've talked about it. We're making the preps for the performance build center for the, the engine area, but I don't know how much discussion we've been in the past about the plan at all. I was just going to ask, but Z51 uh, seems to be always pretty good at everybody wants to warn them. You hear about the tire, you hear about some other issues. Are, are those pretty much resolved if you don't go to get Z51 production? Uh, every time we launch a new Corvette, you know this, uh, at the beginning, there's pent-up demand. Everybody wants the loaded cars. All the dealers want to stock their yard for loaded cars. Everybody wants to make as much money as they can while the car is hot. And so we've seen it time and time again where when you're the first couple of years bring the car out, everybody wants all that stuff, and then it tapers off uh, after a while and reaches a, a natural balance. There's a lot of reasons why people want Z51. You know, the media's gone crazy uh, over it. It has a lot of uh, content, and you have to thank Harlan for underpricing it. You know, he, <laughs> <laughs> he did, he bought it, uh, but the powers at the top of the company, seeing you know the demand, um, said no, we'll, we'll take another $1,200 uh, for that. And even when we introduced the car to the media and we told them all the content of Z51, they were scratching their heads like. It's too cheap. Why are you doing this? And we're like, it's a gift to our customers. But then we get into trouble because uh, you know everybody wants it, and then uh, we don't capacitize for it. The reason we don't capacitize for it is because long term we know what's going to happen, and it's extremely expensive. Um, you've got expensive uh, aluminum wheels. Um, if you want to capacitize those, you've got to buy additional sets of tools, which two years from now, actually maybe one year from now, when Z06 comes out and starts displacing some of that Z51 demand, you'll have this big expensive uh, forge uh, sitting rusting away, you know, uh, and just completely on you. So it'll be money uh, we've spent, uh, and then it goes completely away. So in the short term, it looks like you guys are crazy, there's money on the table, why don't you capacitize to, to meet this early demand, but we know because of our history long term, that's going to fade away and we'd rather live with uh, the shortages and people having to wait a little bit longer for their car now because long term, <coughs> it helps keep the business case better and that keeps the price of the whole car down. That's one of the reasons the car is such a value uh, that it is. Along that line of cash, have you already begun forecasting for the Z06? Do you think we're talking 6,000 units, like pretty much used to have Z06? And, then and I, I should make the point, 
we recognized that the demand was going to be uh, for the whole car was going to be higher than uh, what our forecasters, our professional forecasters, thought it would be. Uh, we saw the media uh, reaction to the car, and so uh, even Z51, we knew it was going to be a hot seller. We actually spent millions of dollars upping the capacity, and here uh, also in Bowling Green and in many other suppliers. We spent millions of dollars upping the capacity, and what you're seeing now to get to this 170 a day is the result of the company's agreement to spend those millions of dollars. So what you're seeing, even though it seems constrained, we've actually put a bunch more tooling, a bunch more money into it to get it up to the capacity that you're seeing now. That's true of both Z51 as well as the entire car, and it plays right into your question on Z06 because we're looking at the Z06 and the reaction to the Z06, and because it's now, you get a convertible, you get an automatic, we sold, if you look back, we sold 8,000 Z06s when we introduced it uh, in 2006. I was one of the buyers myself. Um, but uh, we, we see that you know we could have demand of much higher than what we saw at the end of the sixth generation car. And so we're actually putting together a business case, to be perfectly honest right now, to see if we want to spend a few more millions of dollars uh, to make sure that we're better able to meet the demand, that spike uh, at the beginning. I don't know what the number's going to be, and it'll probably, you'll probably, a year from now, be asking me, why, you know, why is there such a wait for Z06s? Um, but I'm telling you right now, we're going to put in as much capacity as we think is reasonable to do, uh, but it's still, we still may have uh, people waiting for their cars for a little bit. In the back, let me take one of the very back. Hey, Jeff, Keith Cornell with CorvetteBlogger.com. Uh, recently, the UAW 2164 um, voted overwhelmingly to strike if their concerns over safety and quality issues weren't addressed. Uh, and I understand there's an issue with the personnel department as well. Can you kind of give us some more details on what those safety and quality concerns are? Yeah, so I would, I would categorize it as a little bit of in-house family disagreements. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about us going out. And uh, there's some things to work on, you know, in, in my short time here. We're certainly doing our best to work with the leadership there. Um, I'm not losing sleep at night thinking we're going to take this place out on strike. But we'll work it out. We'll work it out. It's not going anywhere. Okay. It's unfortunate, you know, that sometimes, and I would just tell you, it's just like anything else in life, what you see in the press is a little different than what reality is. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But I don't get to write the articles. And, uh, yeah. uh, what are your plans or have you had any discussions about testing the 24 cars across the street? As a plant? Yeah. We haven't really talked about it. As a company, I answer that better than that. Yeah. Um, we don't have any. We don't have any definitive plans yet. Obviously, it's going to be a fantastic resource. And uh, right now, the focus is on getting it built, getting it finished. Uh, we know uh, there's going to be tremendous uh, capability there, not just GM, but outside. Um, you guys heard Michelin signed up to be the, the sponsor. That's uh, fantastic. It'll give us one more uh, track to test at. Uh, we have our own track uh, in Michigan, but like this year, it was under snow for six months. So it's, it's just melting off now, and we're just able to get back on track. So. Uh, like Jeff said, the last time I was here, just a few weeks ago, <laughs> it actually snowed down here. But in a normal winter, um, it's, it's much shorter and we may be able to use that for our own uh, track duty. So there's lots of uh, great ideas floating around about the best uh, way to use that, uh, both internally. You're not going to see uh, the plant as part of their audit that Jeff talked about coming over to the track and just flogging the car at 10 tenths, and then yeah. handing it over to a customer saying, break it in easy. <laughs> Take it easy for the first 500 miles. <laughs> we're, we're not going to do that. No! But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we will have uh, opportunities maybe to take uh, captured test fleet cars that uh, we, General Motors, own and are carefully broken in. There may be opportunities to take those cars out, so cars that are going to stay in our possession uh, for a long time. We would never do that for a customer car. I think there's so many good ideas of what to use uh, for that track that we're going to have an excess you know, of demand for different things that we can do, and we're going to have to sort out what the priorities are. Yes, in the back. Do you have a date for the conversion to the 15 model? It's in, like I say, late summer in the August time frame. It's about as close as I'll get, but it's uh, it's right in that August time frame. So if you have a 14.
13 on order, you kind of see where, where you, when, does we, when will we stop? We're, we're, I think final orders for 14s are in that June, sometime in June. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. And we have to be, you know, people always try to pin us down, well, you know, what's the day you're going to start uh, producing uh, Z06s? And usually the question is really, when are you going to produce my Z06? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> So we, we kind of dance around that question a little bit because there's a lot of things that we don't control. Um, you know, different issues around uh, supply community, uh, development progress, uh, a lot of things can go wrong. And if we go out there and say, as of this day, we're we absolutely guaranteed, we still have work to do. It's not like it's in the bag and we're just, you know, sitting around with our feet up on the desk waiting for that day to, to flip the switch. We're uh, working really hard all the time uh, behind the scenes to get this stuff uh, ready, we need to make sure it's done perfectly. And so sometimes there's glitches of one sort or another. And so we don't like to, you know, as, as, as soon as you commit to one day, and then if it's like one day later, what does the media say? Uh oh, what's wrong? Oh, there's, some, 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 there's, some, there's a quality problem, there's some other issue with it. Uh, and that's not really true. We're just getting our work done, making sure the car is perfect. And uh, sometimes it takes a little longer uh, than you expect based on unknown issues. And so, you know, we have goals uh, about when we want to get things done and we try to meet those goals, but we don't want to promise something and then uh, not be able to deliver. But the launch processes we have are outstanding and they really are geared towards the cargo is when it's ready. And it's not, you know, push it out the door and pray and hope. It's, you know, it's ready. In the back. Um, you're going to need a retro trip for the PDR. <laughs> uh, it would be an extremely challenging uh, retrofit. Uh, they, even though uh, Jeff talked about the electrical architecture, uh, every year uh, there's evolutionary changes, kind of uh, software, hardware calibrations uh, behind the scenes. You'll see uh, all the stuff you're used to on 14 carrying over to 15 and then some new stuff. And most people think, well, that new stuff is just like 1% of the total amount of electrical content in the car. Why can't you just like reflash that extra 1% in and then I get the 15 uh, working, all that 15 stuff. But it doesn't work that way because, uh, you know, there's more computing power on this car than, you know, a space shuttle had. Many, many different computers all talking to each other in different languages and doing checks and balances and all sorts of different things you can't even imagine. Um, so it's not like you can just tack on an extra little feature. You really have to go in and rebalance the whole system, revalidate uh, the whole system. So it's very, very complicated uh, from one year to the next. So it'll be a pretty rare condition. Occasionally we can do it, uh, depending on how uh, the particular issue is. But with PDR and like some of the electrical uh, new features that Harlan and I talked about yesterday, uh, you're not going to be able to just reflash those uh, into the car. Time-wise, we'll grab one more and then we're going to get into the next group's presentation. Oh, you, okay, two more. What you and you, go ahead. You know, initially, a lot of it was in the fit and finish side. Getting used to fitting and getting the, the you know, all of the exterior panels lined up and get in the way we wanted. Gap and flush was the primary one. And then paint, you know, I mean, everybody you know, can see the blocks of things. We've had our struggles with getting the finish where we want it. We're constantly working on it. There's a lot more behind the scenes we're working to keep improving it. But those, those are two areas I'd say for the most part, the biggest challenge. Well, I don't know, we're north of 30 already, right? Yeah, we're getting there. Yeah. So, it's going to be 30-something. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely going to be north of 30. You know, figure by the time we're done. Again, like I say, right now we're putting out more than 3,000 a month. Now, so you can kind of do your own little forecast, May, June, there's another maybe 10,000 plus a month ago. So what was the biggest year? Well, if you go way back, uh, <laughs> way back, we had two shifts, and, uh, yeah, something 70, it was 60, 60, 70,000. Yeah, in the modern era, uh, I think the biggest year was like 42.5, uh, second, the full year of the C6, where we had the Z06 out, and we were just going gangbusters. Yeah. We're ready north this year, north time. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody, thanks for your attention, great questions.